Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Logan. I'm the Director of Defense and Foreign Policy Studies here at Cato. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to our virtual book forum this afternoon for a new edited volume um, from Professor James Goldgeier and my colleague Joshua Schifferson entitled Evaluating NATO Enlargement from Cold War Victory to the Russia-Ukraine War. And normally what I would do at this time is hold up a copy of the book which I unfortunately don't have, because this book, like uh, in, in, in the literal sense, um, exhibits both aspects of um, um, the study of international politics. So on the one hand, there's a very expensive physical copy, which is available for purchase. But at the same time, the, the authors or editors, I should say, have made a real effort to make this information accessible to students and up and coming students of international politics. So for any students or professors who are viewing the event this afternoon, who have access to Springer link through their university, the entire volume I believe is available for download. And I think that's very useful for pedagogical purposes. Um, it's obligatory at the outset of these discussions to say, um, it's always kind of unfortunate when this kind of work becomes relevant in international politics, because most of the time, um, these things are sort of purely tweedy academic discussions. Um, and then unfortunately, at times they come into the realm um, of regular people's lives as they of course have uh, subsequent to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So with an edited volume, it's always a bit of a trick to, to give a good flavor of the book because it covers so much breadth. But we're very privileged to have both of the editors with us this afternoon to sort of problematize and set up how this book came to be and how it was assembled. And then two different chapter authors, one author was co one uh, chapter was edited by Will Ruger and a single author chapter by Professor Kimberly Martin. So with that sort of introduction out of the way, um, what I will do is introduce both of the editors and both of the chapter authors in turn, um, who will set up and then discuss the volume and the chapters respectively. The first speaker this afternoon will be Professor James Goldgeier, who's a professor, professor of international relations at American University here in DC. Um, he's the former Dean of SIS, the School of International Service at AU, um, and the author of a book that basically everybody who has looked at the question of NATO enlargement has already read, entitled Not Whether But When, really a seminal study um, of NATO enlargement. 
also germane to the discussion this afternoon. He was the director of Russian, Ukrainian, and Eurasian affairs at the National Security Council. He's a senior advisor to the Bridging the Gap project, which tries to bring international relations scholars in discussion um, with the sort of policymaking apparatus here in Washington. He has a PhD and MA from UC Berkeley uh, and an AB from Harvard. Next, we'll hear from Joshua Schifrensen, who is my colleague at Cato, a non-resident senior fellow, but also an associate professor in public policy at the University of Maryland up the road. He's the author of Rising Titans, Falling Giants, How Great Powers Exploit Power Shifts, and also germane to our discussion this afternoon, the author of what I think is a very important article in international security in 2016 or 17, I believe, entitled Deal or No Deal, The End of the Cold War and the U.S. Offer to Limit NATO Expansion. Um, Josh has a PhD from MIT and a BA from Brandeis. Then respectively, we'll hear from Professor, Lee, Professor Kimberly Martin, who's a political science professor at Barnard College, Columbia University. Um, and one of the great privileges of going through bios is un unearthing things that are fascinating about authors that you didn't know. And a book that I believe was Professor Martin's dissertation, which subsequently turned into a book, um, was engaging the enemy, organizational theory, and the Soviet and Soviet military innovation from 1955 to 1991, which I confess that I have not read and I am now going to read because I'm fascinated just by the book's title, which is a real rarity in political science. She has a PhD um, from Stanford and an AB from Harvard. And finally, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Will Ruger, who is the president of the American Institute for Economic Research. Prior to that, he was a, a hugely influential uh, part of the Stand Together um, Charles Koch Foundation outfit um, looking at uh, foreign policy in particular over the past six or seven years and had a big impact on shaping the debate here in Washington. He is an officer in the U.S. Navy Reserve and a veteran of the Afghanistan War. Um, he was the nominee to be U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan at the tail end of the Trump administration um, and Will holds his Ph.D. from Brandeis uh, and an A.B. from William & Mary. So with my rambling introductions all out of the way, uh, I think the batting order will be Goldgeier, Schifrensen, Martin, Ruger. So with that, Professor Goldgeier, please take it away. And thanks to Kendo for hosting this event. We really appreciate the opportunity to be able to discuss these issues with you. Um, just a word about, about how this started. Uh, a few years ago, I've long been disappointed with the debate over NATO enlargement. It has tended toward the extremes. Uh, is tend to not to have a lot of empirical evidence behind a lot of the claims. Uh, and uh, people who argue either for or against the policy typically don't weigh it against other potential policies and the pros and cons of each. So a few years ago, I called Josh Schifrensen because I admire his work greatly. And I, and I knew that he and I have different perspectives. I've long supported enlargement and he's long been skeptical of enlargement. And I said, you know, we should work together because if we could work together uh, to try to improve the debate, that would be a contribution uh, on this subject. And he came up with the idea of bringing a group of, of people together to put together a special issue uh, of a journal, which we did, the journal International Politics, uh, led by uh, Michael John Williams from Syracuse. Uh, and we produced that volume in 2020. There were about, uh, I think there were 12 pieces total in there. Uh, Josh, Kim, and, and Will all had pieces in that special issue. And then uh, in uh, May of 2022, a few months after Russia's expanded war against Ukraine, uh, and Anka Puska, an editor at Paul Grave Macmillan, came to us and said, you know, we own the journal International Politics. Given the expanded war, given Finland and Sweden applying for NATO membership, uh, do you think you could get the chapter authors to update uh, the pieces that they had in the special issue? And we could bring a volume out in early 2023. And uh, all of the chapter authors said yes. We were ex extremely excited that they agreed to update uh, their chapters. And then we added four new chapters uh, to try to round out the volume. And uh, we're, we're really pleased at uh, the range of debate uh, embodied by this volume, and as you mentioned, Justin, the fact that university libraries subscribing to Springer Link products 
uh, will enable faculty and students to, to download the book for free. That's great. Josh? Well, so so thank you, Justin. And Jim gave a lot of the background to this. You know, when Jim called me uh, over four years ago, and I was suggesting that we somehow work together to surface our disagreements, but also try to make progress in the debate. You know, it was a real opportunity because I, I, I don't consider myself a NATO person. I study American foreign policy. I came to NATO through sort of a roundabout way. And so this opportunity to work with Jim uh, really was too good to pass up. But part of the endeavor here wasn't just to engage different perspectives on the NATO expansion debate, but also try to surface different areas in which NATO expansion played out. Because NATO expansion is often treated as kind of this one monolithic thing. But in fact, expansion had different implications, different uh, perspectives surfaced in the, consequent, in the context of the United States, in the context of Eastern Europe, in the context of the non American long-standing NATO allies like Britain, like like Germany, like Canada, uh, and for NATO as an organization itself, and of course for Russia and other parties outside of the alliance. And so the opportunity to bring different scholars reflecting different uh, disciplinary backgrounds, different uh, international perspectives, and so on, together to examine the host of issues here was really just too good to pass up. So one of the things we're really pleased with in this volume is not only the breadth of the material, but also the ability to bring different facets of the debate to light in the hopes of making progress. You know, this is an issue that, as you alluded to, Justin, is sadly germane to contemporary policy issues. And fully in keeping with academic inquiry, uh, the principles of free uh, inquiry that, you know, that that Cato stands for, we're really hoping that we can surface some uh, ideas that will improve the state of policy discourse and improve the policy debate going forward. And so it's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to have the volume out. And we're hoping those listening and watching will be able to access the volume and hopefully learn something from its contents. Thank you, Josh. And Professor Martin, to set things up, your chapter looks in some detail at the implications and debates surrounding NATO enlargement inside Russia. So with that sort of overarching theme, what did you find when you examined this question? Well, thanks so much for having me here. I'm grateful to the to Cato and also grateful to Josh and Jim for including me in this volume. It's been a terrific experience. So there's no question that Russia reacted negatively at a diplomatic and political level to NATO enlargement right from the start. Um, NATO enlargement was always an irritant to Russia. But that doesn't mean that NATO enlargement threatened Russia militarily. The evidence indicates that it did not. It doesn't mean that NATO enlargement was responsible for the downturn in the Russia-West relationship. There were too many negative things going on in the relationship simultaneously. And I would argue that other things were much more bothersome to Russia than NATO enlargement was. Um, and finally, there's no evidence whatsoever for the claim that's been made by both Vladimir Putin and John Mearsheimer that Ukraine was becoming a de facto member of NATO and that Ukraine's militarization was what caused the 2022 invasion. So I cover other things in the paper, but what I'm going to talk about here in some depth is those three points. So first of all, the evidence that we have is that Russia did not react militarily to anything happening near its western borders until just before it seized Crimea in 2014. OSCE data on Russian forces actually shows a decline in troops and weaponry deployed in the Western and Southern military districts from the late 1990s until 2014. One exception was an uptick in air defense systems in Kaliningrad in 2012. That's the little area that's an exclave of Russia. Um, but that was after a decade's delay in plans to deploy them long after Russian expression of feelings threatened by NATO enlargement. Um, and if we want to be more direct about it, long after Russia's invasion of Georgia in 2008. Meanwhile, NATO forces declined rather than growing. NATO had no plans to defend NATO or, um, in the Baltics until 2010. Poland lacked um, any sense of even a self-defense doctrine until the Russian seizure of Crimea in 2014. Uh, Poland was focused solely on out-of-area peacekeeping operations with NATO. And enlargement actually made NATO weaker militarily than it had been before. Until Finland joined NATO this year, it would have been very difficult for NATO to reinforce the Baltic states in the event of a Russian invasion. By land, there's a little piece of territory called the Savalki Gap, 
that's a tiny land border between NATO and the Baltics that connects Poland and Lithuania uh, with the Russian ally Belarus on one side and the heavy militarized Russian region of Kaliningrad on the other. So that would have been difficult. Um, and by sea and air, Russia had the ability to use missiles um, that were stationed on Kaliningrad um, to make NATO access to the Baltic Sea very difficult. Now, Putin did say that he felt threatened by Romania and Bulgaria joining NATO because of their location on the Black Sea. But there was a very tiny um, presence of US forces there. Um, there was no buildup of their military forces. And Russia would have had huge amounts of advance warning if there were any uptick in NATO forces deployed there or any sense of threat. And so in fact, what we see is that NATO did everything possible to demonstrate its defensive military intentions in Europe and Russia in its, it, how it reacted appeared to take that defensive orientation seriously. Meanwhile, the things that were truly much more disturbing to Russia were happening on a global level. And there are two in particular to keep in mind. The first is the decline of the United Nations Security Council as a Russian tool of influence, starting with NATO unilateral airstrikes against Kosovo in 1999, then US coalition airstrikes against Iraq in the late 1990s and the US led invasion of Iraq in 2003, and the United Kingdom, France and the United States effectively negating a promise that was made to Russia in the Libyan intervention in 2011 not to engage in regime change. Simultaneously, there is another threat globally to Russia, and that was the decline of arms control. And these days, we think about the decline of arms control as being the fault of Russia, as Russia being the one who is um, making the first moves out of arms control arrangements. But we have to uh, remember that the US took that move first in 2001, 2002, by unilaterally abrogating the anti-ballistic missile treaty of 1972, which had set a, a special place for Moscow in um, global security negotiations. And in fact, what I think threatened Russia the most was not this sense of military threat, but a global loss of influence and prestige. And NATO enlargement was a reflection of that. It did not cause that. In fact, Russia lost its Warsaw Pact allies long before NATO enlargement began. Finally, on the 2022 war, Russia seized the Ukrainian territory of Crimea in 2014, and Ukraine took absolutely no military actions to attempt to get it back. Russia has a huge nuclear arsenal. Ukraine has none. Ukraine voluntarily gave up its ability to manufacture nuclear weapons when it signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty um, at the time of its independence in the early 1990s. Russian military personnel outnumbered Ukrainian military personnel by a factor of more than four until the US and its allies began rushing weaponry and equipment to Ukraine in January 2022, when intelligence clearly showed that Russia was about to invade, the only lethal weaponry that Ukraine had obtained from the US or any NATO allies were Javelin anti-tank missiles with a maximum range of four kilometers and approximately 20 armed drones from Turkey. And what this means is that Ukraine in 2022 could not possibly have threatened Russian territory militarily. Um, the US and European military trainers who were on the ground in Ukraine were intentionally kept 750 kilometers from Ukraine's eastern borders to ensure that there was no possibility that they could be threatening to Russia. And again, Russia would have had a huge amount of advance warning if any of that had changed. So I'm happy to talk about any other details in the Q&A, um, but let me just close by saying that we don't know why Putin invaded Ukraine. He gave all kinds of different reasons in different forums at different times. But I think it appears that he actually believed his own nationalist rhetoric about the two countries being one people. We know that he wants to go down in history as the man who made Russia great again. And he apparently thought that invading Ukraine would do that. But we do know that there's no evidence that it was because of NATO enlargement. So I'll stop there. Great. Thank you very much. Um, that was a really succinct laying out uh, of your argument. We appreciate that. Um, Will Ruger, your chapter uh, looks at kind of the, the bilateral, I think you would say, aspects of U.S.-Russia relations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, NATO enlargement or NATO expansion. Why don't you tell us what your chapter argues? Yeah, uh, so my co-author Raj Menon and I have been studying and worried about NATO expansion for some time. Um, I wish it weren't so relevant, to be honest. Um, but uh, like Jim talked about, uh, you know, this this has become quite salient this issue. And uh, I'm not as uh, sanguine as as uh, Kim is about the uh, uh, about about the idea that NATO was irrelevant to this. Uh, I do think it's it's important to be careful and not be monocausal. Uh, I think that would also be wrong. 
Uh, but I do believe that that the issue of NATO enlargement when it came to Ukraine and, and Georgia uh, was significantly related to strategic thinking inside Russia. Um, but in our paper, or our article, we start by examining the case for NATO uh, and then move to look at why NATO continued and expanded after the Cold War rather than following alternative avenues. Um, and so we, we start with this kind of history, you know. So again, the Cold War ends, the, the nature of the global balance of power changes. So why doesn't, uh, you know, why doesn't NATO uh, cease to exist, right? Uh, why does it choose to go the other direction and, and expand? And we talk about a few reasons for that. So first of all, uh, it was a security architecture that already existed. So it didn't have to be recreated or created de novo. And, and this provided a significant advantage for choosing NATO as a vehicle for the security architecture that the United States and Europe helped ad ad adopted after the Cold War. Uh, it's also important to recognize that it had demonstrated success uh, in protecting and securing stability in Europe uh, for 40 years. Now, again, the America's Cold War approach, um, you know, we oftentimes talk about the period from the end of World War II to the present as one long period. But of course, there's something really different from the first 40 years than the period after that. Um, in terms of its, uh, especially in terms of its successes, but it would be hard to ignore the successes that it had early on uh, in those first 40 years. So the belief was that it could continue to provide those benefits and, and now it could do so for Eastern and Central Europe as well. Uh, and there was a sense that uh, the costs would not uh, uh, be great enough for this to be something that we should avoid. Um, the other thing is that the balance of power was hugely in favor of the United States and the Western alliance. Uh, you, know, you have the demise of the bipolar system and you have the, uh, the, the uh, quote unquote uh, unipolar moment. And so the fact that the United States simply didn't have uh, a, another object that could push back against it was important to uh, its decision, uh, I think, to expand. And not only were, was the United States interested in expanding its, its uh, security alliance, but also important for promoting it, the belief of that it was important to promote and expand democracy and to consolidate democracies that were emerging after the end of the Cold War, uh, as well as economic reform. The other thing that allowed it is that, look, the opponents of expansion were relatively weak. Right. We talked today, you mentioned in, in, in the uh, in my bio, the, the kind of debate we have in Washington now, particularly between primacists and restrainers. Well, there really was uh, no institutionalized restraint approach or opposition to expansion. I mean, I will give credit to the Cato Institute for being a, a kind of, you know, an original um, uh, charter member of that uh, that was fighting these fights. But look, you have to be honest that you were lonely. Uh, people like. Ted Carpenter and Earl Ravenall and, uh, and uh, Ivan Eland and those folks were relatively lonely. Um, the opponents were few and not very strong, despite being rightly, I think, concerned about provoking Russia um, and that the U.S. would have a difficult challenge of defending these new entrants uh, to provide that security. Uh, and we walk through that in the paper. Um, and I won't go through this fight. It's a, it's, it's a, very, it's a relatively short fight. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, but, but groups like um, the Committee Against NATO Expansion, people like George Kennan were opposed to it. You know, George Kennan, the architect uh, in many ways of the, of the Cold War, um, he said that this was, quote, the most fateful era of American policy in the entire post-Cold War era. Um, and that's one of the reasons why he, he opposed it. Um, but again, they fell short. Um, you know, essentially what happened is, is that despite Russian uh, objections that was that we call we say were early, frequent and emphatic, um, they were rolled. It didn't make much difference. Um, and so we look at the Russian reaction in the next part of the paper. And like I said, it, it was early. It was frequent. It was emphatic. It should have been quite clear to the West uh, that this was not going down easily uh, in uh, in Russia. Um, and we were aware of these objections. Um, you know, the White House and the U.S. Embassy in Moscow understood this. People like Bill Burns, for example, who's now in the Biden administration, appreciated this. Uh, 
Um, but these but these objections were dismissed essentially uh, out of hand by the Clinton administration and others. Uh, and so Russian um, uh, reaction, negative reaction, and uh, the, the reactions of, of certain foreign policy realists in the United States against this uh, were made very little dis difference. For example, Richard Holbrook, uh, he brushed off Russian fears uh, and uh, and was not concerned about the perception that this might be a threat. Um, and I think this is instructive. I mean, Raj and I both note this. It's instructive because I think this attitude that Holbrook had uh, captures the thinking of both the advocates of enlargement at the time uh, and today, uh, particularly when it comes to US, Russia and US, Georgia policy. Uh, I think they brush off these concerns. Um, and I think a, a, an important thing here is to remember that um, these concerns didn't have to be um, fully real, right? The United States didn't necessarily have to pose a real threat to Russia for this to be a concern in Russia uh, that, was, that was impacting how they thought about the relationship with the West and the United States uh, and influenced their approach. Um, you know, again, um, uh, these are subjective feelings of threat that that have that, that play a big part of it. Because look, I would argue that that uh, American foreign policy since the end of the Cold War was defined by a subjective threat analysis that was not all that accurate relative to the realities of the balance of power and the threat environment that we faced. Um, but they still impacted policy, as we've seen in Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, Somalia, Ethiopia, uh, um, the Horn of Africa writ large. Uh, and so forth. Um, but again, these perceptions matter greatly. Now, one of the things about the Russian reaction is that Russia viewed these moves as a repudiation of the idea of inclusiveness after the Cold War. And so they made these, these, their opposition clear. If you look back you know, uh, to July 3rd, for example, 1991, Russia stressed to the United States that expanding NATO would be seen negatively in, in uh, at that time, still the USSR and the RSFSR, uh, they viewed these things as quite problematic. Uh, again, after the downfall of the Soviet Union, Yeltsin told uh, Secretary General Warner that they objected to these things. And then in 1995, again, Yeltsin warned that as NATO moved east, it would lead to, quote, a restoration of what we uh, uh, already had. So referencing the kind of two blocks and the Cold War approach. So that push East really changed the relationship into one that may not have been entirely cooperative, just given the nature of great power politics uh, or even declining power and, and great power politics, but that could have been more cooperative. And really from about 2007, 2008 in particular and following, the temperature was consistently raised. And, we, and, and that's one of the things that we capture in this are some of those things that were going on uh, not least of which was Putin's address to the Munich Security Forum, um, as well as some of the things that we saw, uh, particularly under in the Trump administration, uh, where President Pence, for example, went to um, Georgia and talked about Georgia as if they, and, and mentioned them as if we were already a member of NATO or they were a member of NATO and talking about, um, you know, kind of the respect for their sovereignty that we had. So. Um, again, part of this paper, we try to scope out what could have been alternative paths. I won't go down those since they were all ignored, but these would have been different types of security architectures for Eastern Europe. Um, something that, again, our colleague um, uh, at the Brookings Institution, Michael Hanlon, talked about in the, you know, in the last several years in the prelude to uh, the war in Ukraine, as some people tried to look for alternatives so that we can get off the path of a conflict uh, that we've now unfortunately seen. Um, now, part of the problem, of course, with our approach is that we believe, Raj and I, that this was an unforced error. We didn't need to do this. We could have closed the open door and we should have. Um, neither Ukraine nor Georgia uh, being in NATO was necessary to keep the member states safe. Um, all, you know, and we walk through the details of this, including their kind of the you know, relative size of their economies, the, the, the challenging difficulties of uh, GLOCs in the event that there was a uh, there would be a requirement to defend these countries, uh, the difficulties of defending them, but also why Russia isn't 600 feet tall. And we talk about this at length in the piece. 
Now, I, again, uh, you know, uh, foreign policy analysts are, are like baseball players. You know, you hope you hit for a good average. You're not always going to be right. But the fact is, is that in this case, Raj and I, have, I think, have been proven correct, which is that Russia's performance on the battlefield in Ukraine has shown that it is not 600 feet tall. It is not the threat that would have required um, maintaining that open door policy or enlarging NATO in the first place. Uh, and we go through that logic. And then we conclude by trying to make some suggestions about how NATO ought to approach U.S.-Russia relations and to approach NATO in particular, including greater burden sharing and burden shifting with NATO, something that I think should be how we think about uh, the relationship between the United States and NATO going forward. And we've heard lots of talk about strategic autonomy, uh, especially from the French. These are things that we think would be valuable, not only to the security and stability of Europe uh, and the United States, uh, but also as potentially a way uh, to move forward uh, with the relationship that is inevitably going to have to be one with Russia. And the question is, is how combative uh, or uh, cooperative it can be, especially on issues that are important to both counterterrorism and nuclear arms control. Thanks for that. Well, I want to bring um, professors Martin and Goldgeier in here because I think, you know, there's there was a lot on the table before we started. Now there's even more on the table. So we can just uh, sort of square up to that. But I think Professor Martin raises this point that I think is important and well taken, which is that a perfectly calibrated response to fears, legitimate or otherwise, about NATO encroachment wouldn't look a lot like the operation that Putin launched last February, right? It really does seem like the op itself suggests, to coin a phrase, a belief that it might be a cakewalk, that he might have been greeted as a liberator from the uh, ostensibly Nazi scary regime that occupied uh, the seat of power in Kiev. And of course, you know, that, that ran aground on the shoals of reality quite quickly. Um, within the first, you know, days of the war, I think. So I think that's a really important point to bring up, which is that, you know, a, a, a smart, calculating, realist response to these kinds of fears doesn't really look like this. But at the same time, you know, I think Professor Martin raised this too, right? We do kind of have our divining rod out here and we're trying to figure out why this thing happened. And we have, you know... The, the, the statement that Putin made in Bucharest in 2008, that national security is not based on promises, we view, you know, everyone's familiar with this, right? Um, you have, um, um, you know, a lot of statements in January of 2022 um, saying the core of this for Russia is about NATO expansion. And then, of course, you have the July 2021 speech on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, which really is a heady kooky ideological statement. So we have these heavy ideological kooky statements and we have these protestations about security fears. And Professor Martin's chapter points out that enlarging NATO actually made it weaker. But maybe as a way of me turning the ship all the way around here in the form of this question is to say, wouldn't it be possible for NATO enlargement to make the alliance weaker while making it perhaps more dangerous from a Russian point of view by bringing U.S. military power, which is and always has been the sort of spinal column of the alliance, physically closer to Russia. So how does, I, I mean, I think it's a point well taken to say that it weakened the alliance, um, but couldn't it have also been scary to Moscow by bringing U.S. power closer? And Kim, Professor Martin is ready to roll. Yeah, thank you so much. I have um, several responses to that. The first is that based on a RAND study that was completed a couple of years ago, what we know about how Russian military doctrine looks at a possible threat coming from the United States um, is that the land forces are not really all that relevant to the overall assessment of threat 
because the Russian military believes that a war would start with um, airstrikes uh, coming from the United States, uh, coming from uh, over the Atlantic or from traditional NATO bases in places like the United Kingdom, and that the ground forces would be used afterwards for mop-up operations. Um, and so it, it doesn't appear that Russian military doctrine was focused on this possibility that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the United States was going to deploy hundreds of thousands of troops to the border with Estonia um, and invade Russia. That just didn't uh, seem to be something that they were concerned about. Um, the second thing that I would say is that John Mearsheimer is very famous for having said, wouldn't the United States be terrified if Russia were in Mexico? And my answer to that is that Russia is in Mexico. Um, according to testimony that came out from the US military command a couple of years ago, uh, Russia has more military intelligence agents, GRU agents in Mexico than anywhere else in the world outside of Russia. Um, and we have not seen the US reacting in a way saying, oh, the Mexican border is about to be overtaken by Russians. Um, and so I, I, I think that the idea that in, in today's world, that land-based warfare um, from um, superpowers who control nuclear weapons and have gigantic air forces, um, that's not where the threat is coming from. Where land-based warfare is a threat is to small countries like Ukraine um, that have a very difficult time defending themselves without external assistance from the big bullies that we find um, on their borders. So I think that that answers most of the questions you had, but your, your um, argument was so complex that I'm not sure that I hit everything. So did I miss anything there? No, I think the, the, the question was about the over-determination of uh, Russia's calculations, rational and otherwise, right? Which is to say the debate such as it's been, and I think, you know, if I can say so, your side of the debate has basically run the table, both in Washington and the Academy, the twitching corpses of your opponents are, you know, still maybe uh, 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 alive, but uh, barely so. But that is to say that it is neither perfectly rational, well-calibrated security concerns, nor delusional, revanchist, imperialist ideology, but rather an intermingling of the two, or whether that is, is, is facile and ridiculous? I, I'm happy to come in on this point because I think, you know, a lot of the debate uh, particularly in the West, by by scholars of international politics, focused on this issue of you know great powers, you know wanting a sphere of influence, not wanting to have others interfere in uh, in what they consider to be their sphere of influence, and you know I I think that has been a useful debate in some ways, but it's missed the broader issue, and I think the elephant in the room. And that is Russian imperialism and this deep, clearly deep seated Russian views that countries like Ukraine, that their territory its not just about a sphere of influence, that this territory actually belongs to Russia, should be part of Russia. Um, and I, I think that's what Putin was acting on, this view that, um, you know, he should take advantage of the moment for whatever reasons, as you point out, Justin, the idea that he thought it would be a cakewalk. Um, and and take this territory that he, he thinks, and I think a lot of Russians seem to believe, rightfully belongs to Russia. And I, I think that is really the huge challenge for us as we think about the long-term relationship between Russia and the West, Russia in Europe, a security architecture in Europe where, uh, I mean, it, it's only going to work if Russia gives up its imperial views of its neighbors and accepts the 1991 internationally recognized borders of the Russian Federation uh, that I think, you know, the West would be perfectly happy to say Russia should be secure within those borders. It just shouldn't be going beyond those borders to attack other countries. And I, I think what we've seen, what we've really come to understand, especially since February of 2022, is just how deep seated those views are within Russia. It's not just Putin. It's not just the elite. They seem to be pretty deeply held views among a wide segment of the population. So to Will to Will Ruger and Josh Schifferson, are GRU operatives in Mexico a good analog for Article 5? Um, and what about overdetermination? It, can it be mere security concerns or mere imperialism, or is there some intermingling of the two? Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, look, I, I disagree. I mean, if China, for example, wanted to have an alliance, a formal alliance with Mexico and had a basing agreement, the United States would be uh, south of the border quicker with its Marines and army than you can uh, you know, say go, right? Uh, this is just not something that great powers would tolerate. Now, does that make it justified? Should states be allowed to create their own independent foreign policy? Uh, you know, that's what a lot of people would say. Uh, the funny thing is, is the same people who would say that about Ukraine would probably say something different about Mexico because great powers do what's in their interest and speak out of both sides of their mouth here. Uh, again, that doesn't justify Russia's behavior, um, but I think it helps us understand some of the security concerns that they might have. And look, when it comes to security concerns, the United States got, you know, you know, in the scheme of things, uh, not that worked up about it, but they got worked up about China and Equatorial Guinea. Remember that? Um, so the fact that, the, that Russia would be concerned about what's happening in Ukraine and in Georgia, because these are both uh, connected in important ways, uh, should not be surprising. Um, you know, particularly a country like Ukraine, um, you know, given where this would push, uh, you know, NATO's boundaries and the possibility of American uh, troops being there, uh, and look, you know, you have people in the in the Western establishment always talking about regime change in Moscow, not merely talking about, you know, coexistence, but regime change. Now, look, would I like to see Russia be governed by a, a more liberal democratic order? Absolutely. Um, but you could understand why the Russian state would worry about those types of uh, statements uh, from, uh, you know, responsible people in the West. Uh, not to mention, uh, you know, the utterances and behaviors of uh, administration officials like Toria Newland. So I think we have to be careful in, in saying, look, we are not threatening to others, uh, but not appreciating that others might feel that. Um, and on the issue of, of what caused uh, February 24th, 2022, I mean, look, it's certainly complicated and states throw up a lot of, of, of things on the wall to see what will stick with various audiences, including domestic audiences. So the fact that Putin was talking all kinds of crazy stuff, um, we should take it for what it is, which is that Putin says a lot of crazy stuff and has a lot of crazy ideas, but he's also trying to approach different audiences with different ideas. And the fact is, is that we can't in Washington say, hey, if you wanna understand why Russia did what it did, just listen to Putin when he talks crazy stuff about imperialism and then ignore what he said about NATO expansion over and over again. We can't have it both ways. And what I would like to say is like, look, it's complicated. They, there were a lot of reasons for why Russia did this, but NATO enlargement was contributing to that. Um, and I don't think that we should uh, underestimate that concern, especially given the nature of international politics as we've seen through history, where state gets, states get concerned about alliance arrangements that work against them. Wanted to go uh, touch briefly with Josh Schifferson and then Professor Martin had a two finger on this current round. Well, actually, Justin, let, let Kim go, then, then I'll, I'll offer my thoughts. They're still coming together. So Kim, over to you. Thanks. Um, just I want to remind everybody that there was no Russian reaction outside of verbal comments about uh, NATO expansion. None. There was no military buildup anywhere close to NATO borders in response to NATO expansion. None. Um, I would also remind people that the U.S. has no basing agreements with any new NATO members. In fact, that was part of the um, NATO-Russia um, agreement that was reached as Russia realized that NATO enlargement was happening. Um, it was reached with um, Evgeny Primakov, who was a realist in the mold of Henry Kissinger, um, who accepted NATO enlargement in uh, return for the idea that there would not be any significant new deployment of U.S. forces or U.S. basing arrangements um, in NATO countries. Until the 2014 um, Russian seizure of Crimea, uh, the U.S. presence in Europe had declined dramatically, um, even with NATO enlargement happening. And so there just was not any U.S. military threat. There was no Russian reaction as if there was a military threat. 
On the 2008 Bucharest statement, let's review the history. Um, it was pushed by Condoleezza Rice, who really wanted that statement that Georgia and Ukraine would eventually be NATO members. Um, all of the press reporting made clear that there was no support anywhere elsewhere in NATO for that to occur. There has never been any membership action plan put into place for either Georgia or Ukraine. Um, and if I were Putin, I would not invade another country because of verbal statements that never had any action behind them. Um, and in terms of looking at Russian imperialism, we don't have to rely on Russia's statements. We can look at Russian behavior. Russia, during this entire time of this downturn in relations with NATO, continued to have its own military forces stationed in Moldova and in Georgia and in um, uh, other uh, uh, areas, including Armenia, in ways that violated OSCE requirements. Um, uh, in 2008, Russia invaded Georgian territory. In 2014, Russia took over a sovereign Ukrainian territory that was recognized as sovereign by the United Nations and every other country in the world. And in 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine without any provocation. We don't have to pay any attention to what Putin says. All we have to look at is what Russia does. Russia is an imperialist that believes it has the ability and the right to control military events all around its area. Um, and so I would, I'll stop there. Yeah, I Josh, mean, if we're, if we're, if we're going we to acknowledge that Russia acts like all states uh, in the history of mankind, uh, then, uh, then I think that that's absolutely correct, right? They are concerned about their areas. Has not uh, along. any neighbors and has not intended to take over any foreign countries on a permanent level. It has not said since the end of World War II um, that it has the right to occupy a foreign state for anything except temporarily. And the occupation of Iraq was actually done um, under UN approval. Um, it, was, it was a difficult time, but it eventually had UN approval. And so I don't think that US behavior is um, at all, I mean, I'm not saying the US always does the right thing. I don't mean to say that at all. I was against the Iraq war, um, but I don't think that we can compare what the U.S. did in Iraq and Afghanistan and say it's identical to what Russia did in Georgia and Ukraine. It's just not the same thing. Let's bring, Josh, I see you waiting at the ready here, and I know you have a lot to say, I'm sure. Um, let's bring in, there's a question here, I think, that I can kind of shoehorn it in from my colleague, um, Eric Gomez, that talks a little bit about um, some of these things, but from a somewhat different angle. And those were the kinds of, you know, we, we've, we've heard, you know, we don't need to listen to, to what Putin or Russia says. Um, they did sort of say before they said we should go back to the 1997 borders in Europe, um, that there was an appetite for discussion about the future of NATO, particularly in the context of Ukraine. And the administration, Derek Gillette, revealed in an interview that the administration never really bit on this. So there was a kind of, and maybe we'll start with Josh on this and then go around the horn, there was a kind of discussion that it was ridiculous for anyone to think that Ukraine had any hope of getting into NATO. But at the same time, we weren't going to close the open door or even talk to Russia about our plans for Ukraine and NATO, which didn't exist um, out of principle. So, you know, Eric sort of says, how do we get those two things together? We're, of course, getting bogged down in the context of the Ukraine war and NATO, and we have this whole uh, beautiful volume uh, to discuss. But I guess let, maybe let's see if we can close this out here in five or 10 minutes and then, uh, and then, and then move on. So, Josh, what do you have to say? Oh, thanks, Justin. That's a, that's a very s small order. I appreciate that. Um, so so I, I'm grappling with two different issues at play here, right? So I, I take the point that Russia may well be an imperialist power, but I'm also grappling with the question of why only in 2022 did this invasion occur, right? It seems that the timing is underspecified if we argue it's just about Russian uh, imperialism. And I, and I agree, by the way, that it's not just Putin, Navalny and others in Russia have this sim similar sense of Russian uh, right or authority o over the near abroad. And so what seems to me to be going on here, a lot of it, is the perspective that Kim offers and Will offers um, actually aren't necessarily all that far apart. It seems very plausible to me that much of the discussion about NATO expansions, about making NATO the premier security organization on, on the European continent, and if we believe the rhetoric of people who have been advocating for NATO expansion in the policy space, it's, it's also an organization that generates diplomatic leverage for the United States, an organization that generates economic influence for the United States and beyond. And in that context, it seems very plausible 
as one of the other chapters in the volume lays out by Bill Woolforth lays out, that what we have here is a slow moving security or in, is spiral between two equally revisionist powers. Now that doesn't tip over into conflict. That doesn't explain how we get outright warfare. But there, I think uh, the combination of Russian uh, grandiosity and, imperial, and potential imperialist ambitions, and the fact that, that in the latter half of 2021, the US, even without talking about NATO expansion to Ukraine per se, was signing agreements with Kyiv, emphasizing defense and diplomatic cooperation, may have presented a window of opportunity for Russia on the one hand to get well, b before the U.S. could uh, bolster Ukrainian defenses, which would be consistent with the NATO uh, concern. And at the same time, um, would be, seem to be further um, denying Russia what it's what it self-identifies as its right of influence over its near abroad. So I kind of see this as a security spiral that's been walking onward for about two decades before finally tipping into conflict because of the combination of Russia's weird view of its near abroad and a series of actions that the US and others took below formally taking Ukraine into NATO, but nevertheless consistent with the idea of deepening Ukraine into, in, in Ukrainian integration with the West. So uh, in that context, Cholet's uh, statement that the US was not going to negotiate over the future of NATO expansion would be just proof to Moscow, or could be taken as proof in Moscow, that Russia was just not going to get a fair hearing, that it was not going to get a seat at the table, and that therefore only unilateral means for that Russia controlled would resolve this question of what would be going on near in Russia's near abroad. So I view these things as really lumping together in a very compelling and spirally kind of fashion. If I can uh, try to get us a little bit looking forward, because something that came out, we did the, the pre dry run for this yesterday. It's something that I think was very interesting, were some different views about you know, and it sounds silly to say, but this European security architecture after Ukraine, you know, we heard mentioned the idea of strategic autonomy, which I mentioned twitching corpses before that really corpse, uh, uh, corpse doesn't seem to be twitching that much, even very much anymore. Um, there's talk about um, non NATO, but Article five ish security guarantees, presumably from the United States to Ukraine. Um, so it, at the risk of getting bogged down in the war, which we don't like doing, um, I'd love to hear the panelists and maybe starting with Professor Goldgeier and then Will Ruger and then Professor Martin and then Josh, maybe if you could wrap us up. Th this question of NATO enlargement and its contribution or not to security problems in Europe um, has sort of you know been in the atmosphere here for 30 or so years. And it may remain in the atmosphere. It may kind of continue to percolate because we're having these, these widely divergent visions for European security after uh, the war in Ukraine. And this war, thank God, like all wars must end. Um, but there's a really, again, a lack of agreement, even within the 31 going on 32 members that comprise the alliance itself. So again, if maybe if Professor Goldgeier, Will Ruger, Professor Martin and Josh could sort of wrap things up with two or so minutes um, on where from here and what does the recent past tell us about where we need to go uh, in the future? Make a few um, quick points. First of all, I don't think this war does have to end. I mean, in a sense, I don't think there's going to be a formal peace settlement. Um, and remember, it's been going on since 2014. Um, I mean, the fighting could subside. I hope the fighting will will subside um, after uh, Ukraine hopefully takes liberates more of its territory uh, in the coming months. But I think, you know, we're going to have a state of war between these two countries uh, for a long time to come. Uh, I want to highlight one feature of, of Will Ruger and Rajan Menon's chapter in the, in the book that I do agree with, which is the unfortunate over-dependence of Europe on the United States for European security. Um, and this is something that, you know, uh, the United States contributed to a great deal in its attitudes uh, towards European, uh, greater European uh, strategic autonomy, as the as the phrase goes. And I, I think, you know, one thing we've we've learned from this war, I mean, Europe really is hugely dependent on the United States for security. Uh, it's not going to change anytime soon. Um, and I think that that is a problem. I think we we need to see a Europe that can do more for itself. 
My own views actually have changed with respect to the West and Ukraine uh, in favor of Ukrainian membership. I, I you know, I don't want to um, have Will fall off his chair, but uh, you know, I, I, my, my position on on European security and NATO previously was that the uh, that the enlargement was generally uh, a worthwhile policy, especially in responding to the desires of the Central and Eastern Europeans and the creation of security across Europe. Uh, but that the Bucharest Declaration of 2008 was a huge mistake. Uh, it gave no path and it angered the Russians and it just there wasn't any need for it. Uh, you know, this idea about provoking Russia, I, I have come to the conclusion that the only way we're actually going to create a stability between NATO and Russia is for Ukraine and others to be part of NATO. It's clear, you know, NATO has been very careful during this war not to spark a direct conflict with Russia. And Russia is very careful. Putin's been very careful not to get into a direct conflict with NATO. And so I think the only solution I see for really um, stability would be for these countries to be part of NATO and to then have a relationship between NATO and Russia. Um, but the Biden administration has made clear that it does not favor Ukrainian membership in NATO. And uh, other Europeans like the Germans are going to follow suit on that. So I don't think it's going to happen. But um, I think that would be the course to pursue. Yeah, well, what do I, mean, you I, I think that, um, you know, a, a different architecture than I think that Jim lays out is probably going to have to be part of the answer simply because I don't think it's in the cards, either the Europe, some of the Europeans that Jim talks about or the United States to accept bringing in Ukraine in a situation in which uh, there is a, a, a frozen or a um, less hot but still hot conflict happening there. Um, and then the idea that the Russians would accept uh, Ukraine uh, as being part of NATO as part of a broader deal to end the war, I, I just don't see in the cards either, unless there was just a substantial um, uh, failure along multiple fronts that would threaten uh, Crimea, for example, and even then. I mean, I, I would see escalation as more likely than uh, kind of uh, capitulating and accepting something that I think would would really uh, be a, ca a cause for the regime to be to be a, a overthrown domestically. Um, I just can't imagine the Russians making these sacrifices and then uh, giving in to something that like Jim talks about. Um, again, I could be wrong. Um, you know, again, I look at things a little bit differently in where I come from than probably most, uh, you know, uh, liberal internationalists on this, which is I don't start from the, the how do we help solve the problem in Ukraine when I think about what types of security commitments the United States should have. I think about what's in America's national interest, narrowly defined to mean our territorial integrity, right, our homeland security, the conditions of our economic prosperity and our liberal democratic system here at home. And I don't see how Ukraine being part of NATO adds to that. I mean, I've been opposed to this, this potential expansion from the get go. Um, I don't see how the war changes America's key interests and how Ukraine could help that. In fact, I think it goes the other direction, showing how this would actually imperil those national interests um, to even think and not toss out uh, the idea of uh, an open door. So uh, again, I would like for American national interest to be coterminous with, with good things happening in Ukraine, but that's not always the case. And therefore, at that point, I choose American national interests first, second, and third. Professor Martin and Josh, in conclusion, then your is and your ought about the future of European security and whether or not they're the same thing. So um, first, I would say that the reason that Russian aggression matters to U.S. homeland security is Putin's personality, which is that if he succeeds in taking over a significant chunk of Ukraine, he will try elsewhere and he will keep on going until he's stopped. Um, in 2016, I kind of laughed at Hillary Clinton when she compared Putin to Hitler. Um, but in retrospect, I think she may have been right more than I uh, knew at the moment. 
Um, in terms of whether um, Ukraine should be part of NATO or not, uh, one thing to think about is that Putin essentially said that he thought that Ukraine was already part of NATO, even though um, it didn't have a formal agreement. And so um, I had previously been very much opposed to having NATO extend to Ukraine. And now I don't think it matters quite so much um, because I think no matter what happens, uh, Russia, um, um, unless there is a regime change far away from the direction that Putin is taking, and I don't believe that's going to happen, uh, will from now on see Ukraine as part of the West. And it doesn't really matter whether it's officially in NATO or not. Um, but I just wanted to answer uh, what Josh said about timing. I think most Russia experts think that crucial in the timing was the pandemic um, and Putin's self-isolation during the pandemic, where he basically spoke to very few advisors and the advisors he spoke to reflected his own thoughts back at him. And so he became weirder and weirder and more convinced that he had this correct interpretation of history because no advisors were pushing back on him. And that's something that can happen in any authoritarian state. Um, but I think in this case, the isolation that he imposed on himself during the pandemic helped it. Um, and in terms of other things that went into the timing, Angela Merkel was out. And so there did not seem to be a very strong voice that was bringing Europe together. Um, and Joe Biden appeared to be um, completely flummoxed by domestic polarization. Um, that meant that he could not concentrate on international affairs. And so I think that that um, may have been Putin's um, thinking about whether there was um, opportunity. Um, and then I'd also just like to bring up that something Mary Cerati uh, mentioned uh, recently in a talk that I heard her give. Um, which is that Putin seems to have a fixation on anniversaries and his invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 was the 30th anniversary approximately um, of the independence of Ukraine from the Soviet Union and the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I'll stop there. Josh, bring us home. So you asked is and ought for the future of European security. Thank you, Kim, for, for those details. I have, I have to play with those and I have to grapple with them. Uh, but is and ought for the future of uh, European security. Look, I, I think the war, the war in Ukraine reveals both Europe's dependence upon the United States, as Jim and Will and everyone else mentioned. And it, it's also the worst of all worlds, right? Russia has shown itself to be sufficiently threatening that the US gets back involved, yet sufficiently ineffective uh, on the battlefield that the European allies aren't really going to step up heavily. You know, Poland and the Baltics being something of an exception for your geographic reasons. Ought though, and this is where Jim was, uh, Jim and I are in violent agreement. The U.S. has other priorities in the world, be they domestic and be they elsewhere, you know, el elsewhere in other regions. So ought would be a wonderful situation to see the Europeans either within NATO or on their own via the EU or some other defense apparatus really investing much more in their own security affairs. I will just note, and here I'll echo Jim, that the more the Europeans actually bootstrap themselves and pull themselves together, the dimmer and dimmer are Ukraine's own prospects for joining said security apparatus. because at the end of the day, the Germans, the French, and to a lesser extent, although profoundly the British, don't really want to wait, risk a war uh, with Russia for the sake of Ukraine or arguably for other states in Central and Eastern Europe. So in a way, is and ought actually point to a very different direction for the future of European security architecture, and also a very different direction for the future of East-West relations in general. Let me just conclude by saying that I really appreciate this book. I confess I haven't read all of the chapters yet, um, but I've read several of them. I think it covers a really wide gamut um, of the debates that we can and, and, and should be having. And I think it's like an actually uh, encouraging thing uh, that Josh and Jim say they don't agree about everything, but they thought it was a worthwhile effort to edit a book together for that reason. Um, and I think we could probably do more of that as a community and as a, a city. Um, again, the name of the book, which I don't have the volume in front of me, is Evaluating NATO Enlargement from Cold War Victory to the Russia-Ukraine War. It's out in hard copy from Palgrave Macmillan, I believe, and on Springer Link. Um, you can download the whole darn PDF and read it yourself. Um, I'd like to thank Josh Schifferinson, Kimberly Martin, Will Ruger, uh, and James Goldgeier for their participation here today. Hopefully we have modeled a slim hour on the basis of this volume. Uh, it's same sort of collegial but vehement uh, disagreement. We thank everybody for attending. I'm sorry I didn't get to many of your questions. There were lots. Um, and we appreciate uh, uh, your attendance today. Thank you.